It's still pre-calc, but doesn't mean it's the easiest thing in the world. First one's numerical and easily done in the calculator if you wanted to, but you see the second one and the third one are variable, and so the calculator's not gonna help as much as you would like it to there. So, um, so we would need another technique. So if you wanted to with number six, if you wanted to with number six, you could just type in the sine of the arc cosine of four fifths. So second cosine, inverse cosine, arc cosine, all mean the same thing. And it wouldn't matter what mode you're in because you're doing opposite operations here. So if you're working with radians or if you're working with degrees, the result is gonna be the same, all right? Because you're taking the inverse cosine, let's say you're working in degree mode. What's happening here is because it's a composite function, you're taking the inverse cosine of four fifths in degree form. So that presents you with a degree measure, which you would then find the sign of in degree mode, which would present you with a ratio. So you're undoing what you would be doing initially. But what is easy, real easy to lose sight of is the fact that this arc cosine is some angle. Some angle theta. All right. So what we're really finding is the sine of theta, where theta is the arc cosine of four fifths. So this is the same as sine of theta, where theta is equal to the arc cosine of four over five. All right, now when dealing with inverses, this is an old pre-calc topic, an inverse and an original function, if you want to call it, you know, the, the inverse of the inverse. They, they, they cancel each other out. So you have the cosine function and the arc cosine function. We know that those are inverses of one another. If you compose them, they would cancel each other out. Right? So plug one inside the other. We can apply that idea here by taking the cosine of both sides of the equation here. So I have two sides of the equation. I got a theta and I have an arc cosine. If I find the cosine of both sides, I would have cosine of theta on the left, and I would have the cosine, oops, cosine of the arc cosine of four fifths on the right hand side. On the left, you would be stuck now with the cosine of theta. On the right, the cosine and the arc cosine would cancel each other out, because inverses cancel each other out, to whatever the argument is, right? whatever is contained within the innermost function, and that would be four-fifths. Right, so I now have cosine of theta is equal to four over five. Now, again, we've already figured out the answer. We know the answer is 0.6 or three-fifths if we put it in, in fraction form. So it's like, why are we doing all this? Because again, we have to get over to a process where we would be able to handle this using variables rather than numerical values. Right? So we know what the answer ought to be, so we're trying to work towards that. So what I would want to do here is solve for the value of theta. So then it's like, well, wouldn't it be better if it was theta all by itself? You know, then we could put it into a calculator, but it's not always gonna be so nice. You know, when you find an inverse function yeah, you know, if you remember from last year, year before, they, they weren't always pretty. Sometimes there were radicals that you couldn't identify the value of, all right? So you would get the decimal variation of that. You wouldn't get the fraction form. You wouldn't get the radical form. You'd have no idea what that corresponded to, right? So the best you could do is either put the decimal down and round it and hope you got partial credit or draw a triangle and figure it out. So that's what we're gonna do. All right, so the triangle, if you think about it, 
in the unit circle, any triangle would have the reference angle at the origin and be oriented in such a way that one of the legs of the triangle, the right triangle, would be on the x-axis. Right? So your possibilities would be a triangle in the first quadrant. It could also be in the second quadrant, third quadrant, or fourth quadrant. Right? As long as it's adjacent to the x-axis and the reference angle is at the origin. Right? Now, we're only going to focus on the first quadrant here because if we determine the angle corresponding with the ratio of four-fifths in the first quadrant, knowing ASTC would allow us to determine any other instance in which the cosine function is positive. Cosine function is positive in the first and the fourth quadrant. By figuring out the reference angle in the first quadrant, I could figure it out in the fourth quadrant too. Or I'll note in the fourth quadrant and I could figure out what the real angle is in the fourth quadrant. Right? So cosine, the ratio, going back to algebra one, is the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. All right, the adjacent side of the triangle divided by the hypotenuse. So with the triangle in this orientation, knowing that the reference angle has to be at the origin and it's a right triangle, the adjacent side is gonna be four, the hypotenuse is gonna be five, using the simplest Pythagorean theorem ever, the, the missing side would have to be three. I mean, you could do the workout, but that's your classic Pythagorean triple, three, four, five, right triangle. Very, very simple, all right? So that actually helps us because if I'm looking to figure out the sine of theta, because again, just going back to what we have over here, sine of theta where theta is equal to this arc cosine business, I just created a triangle that'll tell me everything I need to know about the arc cosine of four over five. All right, now I can look at the sine of theta as being the sine of that triangle. All right, the sine of theta, the ratio there is the adjacent, I'm sorry, the opposite side of the triangle over the hypotenuse. The opposite side is three, the hypotenuse is five. All right, so that tells me that the sine ratio, sine of theta, is gonna be three over five. Three over five in decimal form is 0. 0.6, so we have our answer. So the sine of the arc cosine of four fifths would be three fifths. I mean, that's an awful lot of work for something that the calculator will just spit out. But like I said, for number seven, the calculator is not just gonna spit it out for you. All right. So that, that's a lot of review of trigonometry all in one question, but it's all there for you. It's just a matter of decoupling really the original expression so that you're looking at it as two separate pieces. So we had the sine of some angle theta that angle theta was the arc cosine of four fifths. We learned everything we could learn about the arc cosine of four over five in the hopes that we could create a triangle which we could then use to determine the sine ratio which is opposite over hypotenuse. All right, we're gonna do this about like seven or eight more times. So if you didn't fully latch onto the idea the first time, don't worry, you'll get more, oops. So the second one is the sine of the arc cosine of x. All right, so same exact process, except now we're looking at the angle theta. All right, this would be some angle theta being equal to the arc cosine of x. All right, so that's the same as saying, so it's the same as the sine of theta where theta is equal to the arc cosine of x. So far, following the exact same process, the only exception is, instead of writing 4 fifths, I'm writing x.
right? I want to release the cosine from the inverse trig function. So to do that, I would take the cosine of both sides of my inverse trig, uh, my inverse trig equation, but inverse cosine specifically. Cosine of theta is equal to the cosine of the arc cosine of x. On the left, stays as cosine of uh, theta. On the right, cosine of the arc cosine of x. Cosine and arc cosine cancel away, leaving you with just the x. It's always whatever the argument is. All right, the argument being the thing that's contained within the inverse trig function, or any trig function. All right, so in this case, it's just the x. All right, now, I want to apply the same idea here, create a triangle out of this, but I just see cosine of theta is equal to x, and that seems like that's not enough information. But x can be represented as, as uh, x over 1. So I can draw a triangle there. <coughs> Uh, let me bring that down a little bit. I could draw a triangle with the adjacent side being x and the hypotenuse being 1. Because right? again, so katoa, sine is opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. The adjacent side would be x, the hypotenuse would be 1. Now this isn't a simple 3, 4, 5 right triangle. i got to figure out what that missing side is going to be. Right. Now, it's not always the case that I need to figure out the missing side. It's just, in this case, because the sine ratio is opposite over hypotenuse, I need the opposite side. My theta is right here. This is the opposite side, that vertical line segment. Right. So if I don't figure that out, I already know the hypotenuse, but if I don't figure out that missing vertical line, I'm not going to be able to figure out what the sine ratio is. Right. But fortunately, it's still Pythagorean. A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared. All right, so I'll just write X squared plus whatever you want. Doesn't matter, just anything but X. That vertical one, we call it H for height. You call it B for B squared really doesn't make a difference, I'll say b squared, is equal to 1 squared. When you solve for b, you're going to subtract the x squared and then take the square root. All right, so I have a 1 squared minus an x squared, so 1 minus x squared, and then I'm going to take the square root to get that b alone, so it's going to be a radical. So b is going to be equal to the square root of 1 minus x squared. All right, so in comparison to some of the algebra that we've been doing over the last month or so, that's uh, super easy, barely an inconvenience. So we have vertical line segment here, 1 minus x squared under a radical. It's only, I'm only using the positive variation because remember, when you take the square root, it could be plus or minus. Not the case here because it's vertical going above the x-axis. It's going in the upward direction, so that would be a positive measure. If it were going downward into the fourth quadrant, it would be a negative measure. Since I'm only fo uh, focused on the first quadrant reference triangle, I would only want positive numbers. All right, so I need my opposite side. And I need my hypotenuse. So that's going to give me a sine ratio, sine of theta, is equal to the square root of 1 minus x squared over 1. That sine of theta is the same as saying sine of the arc cosine of theta. I'm sorry, of x. Because we already designated theta as the arc cosine of x. So when we figure out the sine of theta, we're actually figuring out the sine of the arc cosine of x, which happens to be the square root of 1 minus x squared. All right. Now, it would be natural to question the importance or the need to do stuff like this. It would be uh, 
really natural in a pre-cal class because you, you wouldn't get to what I'm about to talk about. So if you have a choice, you take a look at the original, the original expression, and the brand new expression. You just ask yourself, which would I rather take the derivative of? Now, it's a simple answer. The one on the right, because you have no idea how to do the one on the left. The one on the right, because you could apply the chain rule. The one on the left, I, we don't know how to take the derivative of the arc cosine function. We could still use chain rule, but if you don't know the derivative rules for arc functions, then you're out of luck. But if we can transform an inverse trig relationship into something algebraic, then we could take its derivative pretty easily. All right, so that, that's the motivation there. All right, so whenever you see a situation like this, you would always have the opportunity to go through it using you know, a strictly calculus-based uh, approach, which would be take the derivative of your original expression as is, if you know the rules, and you'll, you will before too long, or you could find the derivative of this, which is much simpler. Some of us can do that in our head at this point. All right. So, you know, if, you, if you've been kind of slow to the party here in terms of uh, the practice and getting your level of competence up with finding derivatives, then that's a different story. But this, this, might, be, this might be super easy. Yeah, it might be child's play for you. Okay. So for number eight, There's really no difference in difficulty here. It's the same structure. That arctangent of 3x, that's our theta. Now you could start kind of stripping away some of the unnecessary steps. We know that that's going to be the same as theta is equal to the arctangent of 3x. So I don't have to write same as. So I'll write secant of theta where theta is equal to the arctan of 3x. We're going to take the tangent of both sides to release the 3x. We don't have to show the act of taking the tangent of both sides like I showed the act of finding the sine of both sides. I can just write it now as tangent of theta is equal to 3x. tangent of theta is a ratio, opposite over adjacent. I have just 3x, but I can write it as a ratio, 3x over 1. So that's opposite adjacent. Draw a triangle. Theta is at the origin. The opposite side is 3x. The adjacent side is 1. We just need to solve for the missing side. All right, so 1 squared plus 3x squared is equal to the missing side squared. We'll call it C. So we'd square each part, 1 plus 9x squared <coughs> plus. Then we would take the square root of both sides. And that would give me c is equal to the square root of 1 plus 9x squared. All right, so I just need a secant ratio out of this. Yeah? When you're solving that, why couldn't you just um, like radical the whole thing, like both sides of the equation and get 1 plus 3x? Oh, because when you have a plus sign there, that makes it a di uh, sum of two perfect squares, which is not factorable. If an expression isn't factorable, you can't find the square root of it. Yeah, because uh, the shorter answer is if you take 1 plus 3x and multiply it by 1 plus 3x, you'll get 1 plus 6x plus 9x squared. So it wouldn't be equivalent. So maybe that was longer of an answer. Anyway, uh, Sokotoa gives us the ratios for sine, cosine, and tangent. 
we need ratios for cosecant, secant, and cotangent. Fortunately, those are the reciprocals of the sine, cosine, and tangent. So secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Flip it over and you have your secant. Hypotenuse over adjacent. So secant of theta, the square root of 1 plus 9x squared, that's my hypotenuse, over just a 1. That's my adjacent side. Secant of theta is equal to that ratio, which could be simplified just to the square root of 1 plus 9x squared, just ditch the 1. But we know that theta is really the arc tangent of 3x. That's how the whole triangle was developed to begin with, which means that the secant of the arc tangent of 3x is equal to the square root of 1 plus 9x squared. All right. So if you needed to find the derivative of any of these expressions, really uh, the, the first one's irrelevant because that's strictly numerical, that would be zero anyway. But if you needed to find the derivative of number seven or number eight, you would have a choice of taking the derivative of the original expression the way it was originally constituted, which you wouldn't be prepared for just yet, or you use your pre-calc knowledge to kick it on over into an algebraic expression and then use what you do know involving chain rule to figure out the derivative there. All right. Much more manageable at this point. But what we're going to do now is learn some rules for inverse trig functions so that you will, down the line, have a choice. Because right. some of you, before too long, will actually believe, and, and you won't be wrong, that finding the derivative of the sine of the arc cosine of x in its original form, number seven, is actually easier. Right? And some of you would be like, no, I don't want to do it that way. I'd rather convert it over into algebraic form and find the derivative. Right? So there'll be uh, differences of opinion, but that'll be a good thing. Right? So we're going to use implicit differentiation to derive the differentiation formulas for the inverse trig functions. Right? So it's kind of a messy set of instructions, but it's basically saying find the derivative of the arc sine of u. Now, arc functions, inverse trig functions, always result in an angle. That's why for all of these problems, I was able to say the arc cosine and the arc tangent were some angle theta. Arc functions give a result that are reference angles. All right, so this expression here is some angle theta. So theta is equal to the arc sine of u. All right, no idea how to find the derivative of that. So we gotta do something. We go back to the examples that we already covered. Say, okay, well, if I can, if I can make this an algebraic expression, maybe I could do something there, All right? But Aside from that, how about getting it to be an ordinary trig function rather than an inverse trig function? So to do that, I would take the sine of both sides. So now I have the sine of theta is equal to just a plain old u. All right, but that sine of theta is a ratio. That ratio is opposite over hypotenuse. All right, so let's put that u over a one. The u being the opposite side and the one being the hypotenuse. All right, you can draw a triangle, I'll do it up over here, out of the way. All right, the opposite side being U, the hypotenuse being one. 
and we would just have to figure out the missing side. All right, Pythagorean theorem. So I have some unknown leg of a right triangle here, I'll call that A. A squared plus U squared is equal to one squared. <coughs> I gotta subtract over the U squared. So A squared is gonna be equal to one minus U squared. And then I'm gonna take the square root. So that's gonna give me A is equal to, I only need the principal square root, just the positive one, because it's in the first quadrant. So the square root of one minus U squared. All right, so that's going to be my adjacent side. Now, we don't yet know that we need that. So you're just kind of believing me that that's an important piece of information, but you'll see in a few minutes that it is. All right, so we have a well-labeled triangle all set up, ready to go for whenever we need it. All right, but if we go back to what the original question was really talking about, yeah, aside from using implicit differentiation, it's saying find the derivative. Now we're letting theta be equal to the arc sine of u. So this expression is now thought of as d theta dx. So somehow I have to find the derivative of theta with respect to x. It's kind of an issue because I have a theta, but I don't have an x. All right, so we'll have to keep that in mind. But what I can do is kind of like a half measure here is I could find the derivative of theta with respect to u because I have a function of theta in terms of u. All right, or I can find the, the derivative of u with respect to theta. It really doesn't matter which way you go with this. It's going to work either way. All right, but the simpler way to do it would probably be if I rewrite this as u equals the sine of theta, then I could just take the derivative of the left side, that's going to be du d theta. You know, if it were y and x, it would be dy dx, so u and theta would be du d theta. All right, that's the reciprocal of what I want, but, you know, it's a step in the right direction. Now I just need to find the derivative of the sine of theta. All right, derivative of sine of theta would be cosine of theta. All right. Now again, this happens to be the reciprocal of what I want. It's flipped over. So I could flip this if I want, but I would also have to flip the other side of the equation. You can always flip both sides of the equation as long as you do them together. You can't just flip one side of the equation without flipping the other. So if I write this cosine as cosine over 1, I can now flip my equation. All right? So I would end, well, not end up, but I would get as a next step d theta du is equal to 1 over cosine of theta. Now that might seem like that's as far as we can go, but we have our triangle and we have our knowledge of trigonometry. So there's like two more quick steps and we'll have our answer. First off, knowledge of trigonometry, one over cosine is the same as secant. Secant of theta. All right, secant of theta is the same as hypotenuse over adjacent. All right, because cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, so the reciprocal of that would be hypotenuse over adjacent. My hypotenuse here, one. My adjacent, that radical that we came up with before that we didn't know that we needed, but it turns out we do, would give us d theta du is equal to one over the square root of one minus u squared. So close. We have a d theta du, I need a d theta dx. All right, so we must have done something wrong. 
No, no, it's a quick adjustment. There's only one, one last thing that we need to do in order to fix this. Because I can take this here and multiply it by something and get a d theta dx. I would just need to multiply it by a ratio sufficient to cancel out the du. So I need the du to go away. So I'll multiply it by a ratio where the du is on the top and I need to introduce a dx. But I can't just do that to one side of an equation without doing it to the other. So multiply the other side by du dx. See on the left hand side, the du's now cancel and I'm left with d theta dx. On the right hand side, I now have an expression consistent with d theta dx. One over the square root of one minus u squared times du dx. And since theta here is the arc sine of u, we now have a rule for finding the derivative of an arc sine function, regardless of what the u value is. And it took a while, yeah. And it involved like all the math that you've ever learned. Nah, it didn't involve quadratics, or at least not in the classic sense. But yeah, it was fun. Another way to represent du dx, u prime, we're familiar with that. So you could also write this as u prime over the square root of one minus u squared. So if you're ever given a situation now where you have to find the derivative of an arc sine function and you know what the u is. And the u could be really complicated if, if you know, or, or it could be really easy. If, if it's non-numerical, like if it involves a variable, you would just take the derivative of whatever the u is, and then that would be the numerator. The bottom would be radical one minus u squared with u substituting that u value in. All right, we'll do examples like that down the line, but we have five more rules to, to derive. Uh, fortunately, sine, tangent, and secant are the most important ones because co, uh, cosine, cotangent, and cosecant, they're all just negations of the rules for sine, tangent, and secant. That's why, you know, the co-functions, they always have that negate, negated relationship. So if you know the rules for sine, tangent, and secant, then you're good because I can just tell you right now, and we'll practice going through this process because you'll need to know it. This rule is just this with a negative sign. All right, so it's a two for one deal. You figure out one, you know them both. All right, so, um, so yeah. Tomorrow, we'll tackle tangent and secant.